This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Today's episode is really going to be a treat for me, and I think it will be for you, too. If you've listened to this show for any length of time, you've heard me recommend the podcast of Scott Guthrie. He's the consultant and industry thought leader behind the Influencer Marketing Lab. He has a great podcast that I recommend periodically to you here. He's also been named one of Talking Influence's top 50 people in the industry. That's an annual recognition, but I think he's been on it every year they've done it. Scott consults, but he's also a frequent host of the Influencer Marketing Show, also a Talking Influence production, and is frequently quoted and interviewed on the industry, mostly in Europe and the United Kingdom, but also around the world, including by media outlets here in the U.S. He also authors the Fourth Floor Weekly Email Newsletter, which I've bragged about before as probably the best industry news resource for influencer marketing out there. The long and short of it is that Scott is probably the most knowledgeable person on the planet about influencer marketing. His background is in the PR and comms world. He spent time at Ketchum in the United Kingdom, but is an MBA and business consultant going back to the early days of social media. Recently, Scott launched the Influencer Marketing Trade Body in the United Kingdom with six big-name agency and company sponsors. That body is looking to become the trade association for influencer marketing there, but also to unify other bodies around the world, like the American Influencer Council here in the U.S., to put forth a unified set of standards for ethics and such globally. The idea is a much-needed one in the business, and the IMTB is certainly in good hands with Scott at the helm. As you can imagine, he's a busy man, so him spending some time with us is a real treat. Scott and I had a great conversation about a number of topics, including the IMTB, the trend of influencers becoming creative directors, the influencer pay gap, and a lot more. If you're looking for what the top thinkers in the industry are thinking about things, you've come to the right place today. Scott Guthrie is one of them, and he's here. Quickly, before we talk to Scott, I want to make sure you get a little more insight about how clients of our presenting sponsor, Tagger, use that platform. Tagger is a complete influencer marketing software suite that allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. We've been talking to TJ Ferreira, the co-founder of Bubs Naturals, which is a health supplements company, about how he uses Tagger. Tell me just generally what you use Tagger for. What do you do in there the most most often? It's really a validation check for us, uh, first and foremost, for people that we're we're dealing with for any ambassadors or influencers or anything like that. Um, So obviously we have a good inbound and a good collection in terms of um, what our Instagram does, what our social does in terms of Facebook, et cetera. When we have those people in our ecosystem that are either, you know, macro, micro influencers, what have you, it just allows us a quick double check to make sure that they're aligned with our kind of business, our verticals and kind of the direction that we want to go to just say, Hey, okay, cool. Let's keep proceeding and reach out to them and bring them into the ecosystem. Or maybe there's not, I mean, obviously like, you know, every, every business has a, uh, and you know, it has nuances and success channel and we can play in 20 of them or we can go narrow and deep and this tagger just really helps us go narrow and deep with the areas that are successful for us already and just scales it for us thanks to tj and to bubs naturals for sharing their use of tagger to learn more and get a demo to see if tagger is right for you visit jason.online slash tagger today that's jason.online slash tagger the leading thoughts from the leading thought leader scott guthrie is next on Winfluence. Scott, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. I've been a big fan of your work, your podcast, and have uh, followed your your content around thought leadership in the business for a few years now. So thanks for being here. Well, I'm a great uh, sucker for flattery, so I'll take those generous words <laughs> gratefully with both hands, Jason. Thank you very much. So before we get into the meat of the conversation today, which is going to probably revolve more around the new trade body, tell me, I'm really curious, how how did you find yourself 
uh, atop the influencer marketing strategies and a player in this space. This wasn't something that folks our age went to school to become. <laughs> no, you, you're absolutely right, uh, folks our age. No, I suppose I'll, I'll give you the dollar ninety nine tour uh, very, very, very quick. So I, uh, I had to make good on a deal that I made with my doing life partner, Patricia, and so we we went to Australia uh, in about two thousand and fourteen, something like that. Um, and we're meant to go for a year. We enjoyed it. We stayed two years. But I've, I've got an MBA, and I've been re- reasonably successful. Worked for, for FTSE one hundred companies. Uh, along the way but when I hit Sydney no one knew who I was and no one the, the companies that I'd, I'd worked for no one really knew who they were and I wasn't expecting uh, employees employers rather to be lining up at uh, Sydney airport with, uh, <laughs> with with job offices in their hand but I did think it would be slightly easier than it was so I, I this was in the sort of golden age of of blogging uh, and and LinkedIn groups if you remember LinkedIn groups and mm-hmm. uh, uh, I would comment on um, on threads, on blog posts, mainly from PR and marketing people in London, also New York. Little, it, not so much in in Sydney, just because of the time zones and the things I was interested in. Anyway, I I, I, I fell in with a group of uh, quite senior, but by by luck more than judgment, senior people within the PR fraternity back in in London, mm-hmm. um, and the, the comments on 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 these these blogs and the comments on LinkedIn groups, they became longer. And so there was a character, uh, Livit, and so I started up a blog. Um, I, I got friendly with the chief engagement, the global chief engagement officer at Ketchum, uh, sitting, but he was a uh, global PL, but he was in London. Um, and he was doing some interesting initiatives. Uh, in his own time and because of the time difference I'll be sitting at uh, at my kitchen table in Sydney uh, and help him out on uh, filling out some spreadsheets and stuff I've just really uh, an overview of the supplier landscape for public relations Mm -hmm. and so when he came into the office the next morning a lot of it had been done so we became friendly that way and we'd agree and disagree furiously on on blogs uh he he, uh, he he wrote um he wrote a book he asked me to write a chapter then someone else said oh, I, I like your chapter in in Stephen Waddington's book please write a chapter f- on this book so i ended up writing and you know, i became the chapter guy and, and i uh, submitted uh five business books or, or rather chapters within five business books so mm-hmm. th- when i came back from uh sydney uh, I met up with, with with Stephen, and you know we, we we were kind of firm friends, but we'd never met, obviously. Um, and then there was a position at Ketchum London, uh, heading up influencer relations, as they called it, and they kind of liked my input because I was slightly older. Uh, I had an MBA, so I was sort of coming from sort of strategy and consulting down rather than organic up. Because mm-hmm. there were lots of very clever people, as you'd expect, within Ketchum. But some of them had been sort of there, you know, grown up within the organization. So I was coming from a sort of a different way of thinking. And that, that's, how, and, you know, that's slightly longer answer than you're probably hoping for. But that's how I, that's how I came into it. The, uh, I was a director, digital director, influencer relations at Ketchum, which was a London P and L profit and loss, but a global uh, looking after globally uh, Procter and Gamble. Sure, yeah, uh, Ketchum is a very familiar name in the PR industry here in the states too. So obviously a big operation. So that's obviously a, a great place for you to have been. And then you you kind of spun off and became Mister Influencer Marketing. I think over the last three or four years, how did that all come about? Well, again by accident, and, I, and I'm a great fan of your uh, your podcast, uh, Jason. And I was listening to the one that you did uh, the other day. I can't remember if it was published today or or a few days ago, where you were saying uh, that maybe one of your earlier entrepreneur ambitions what well, you struck out a little bit early and yeah. maybe i think i did the same uh, as a solo influencer marketing practitioner so i sort of you know the, the, a great friend of mine said you know it, it's you've got to be half an hour ahead of the crowd no sorry you've got to be five minutes ahead of the crowd not half an hour right uh, if you're if you're half an hour you sort of get you get uh, burnt at the stake uh, like, like a witch and for, for, for heretic suggestions. But if you're five minutes ahead, then they think, oh, I've heard about that. You know, you know, uh, business insiders writing about that, or you know, sort of, I've heard these sorts of terms. So I was probably about eighteen months too early in my endeavours, but it gave me lots of time to. Um, to sort of stake out my claim and understand what I was good at and what other people might be better at. So 
Um, I, I've written, I, I haven't written a book yet, and I, and I love your, your book, Jason, but I've written over 200 articles about influencer marketing, and I've, I've provided the, um, the Paul, the Paul Grave Encyclopedia of interest groups and lobbying and public affairs, if you can believe it. I, I've provided their definition of, of influencer marketing and influencer sort of culture within that. So I've done things sort of as well as uh, writing chapters for other books. So that's that's how I sort of came at it. And now I think management consulting is, is far too grand a, 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 a statement for what I am, but I'm, I'm not a hands-on practitioner anymore um i i work discreetly with brands and with influencer marketing platforms um and sort of advise what's happening next and how they can grow uh their proposition and how they could you know uh, if they want to move into other territories which territory should they move and why should they move there and those sorts of things well, you're 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 certainly they're certainly in good hands because you obviously have a firm grip on uh, not only what's going on now but what uh, is emerging in the future. So, good place uh, for them to be is with you. I also think uh, some people listening know you are also the author of probably the most useful email newsletter I've ever subscribed to, which is the Fourth Floor's Influencer Marketing Weekly Digest. My question there is, how on earth do you find time to keep up with everything in the industry and still consult and speak and start <laughs> trade bodies and host award shows i mean are do you have like this iron man closet full of three or four scott guthries that are flying around doing all this stuff <laughs> well I, I said right at the top of the show that i'm a sucker for flattery so keep going jason <laughs> but i uh, um well first of all i, I it's, a, it's, a, it's a great honor for, for you to to call the influencer digest a, a great newsletter i i obviously got skin of the game i think it's amazing uh the only sadness is that that not more people uh read it and know about it and i think mm-hmm. we need to do I think that Fourth Floor does a, a, a great job at taking my Google document words and uh, making it into a very visually appealing uh, document that goes out every week. But we just, but we need to spend a bit more time pushing out that that newsletter. Subscriber numbers are going up and up and up every week, which is great. But I think I, I, I'm very proud of of that piece of work. Uh, to answer your question, <laughs> it takes a lot of time, but I, I kind of feel as if you know I, that I'm almost being paid. To 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 be to keep up with the industry, so it obviously takes me a lot longer to write than than I'm than I'm I'm paid for or, or to read and to understand, but it, it's a good way of sitting down and thinking. Right now, I need to, you know, what what are the best fifteen stories, and then I write that short little uh, article at the end as well. So it, so there's no there's no short answer, I'm afraid. Uh, skin, skimming lots of um, content every day and every week, and then narrowing it down to the top fifteen or so. Well, it's 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 definitely very useful for anyone who wants to really understand more about influence marketing or the industry, certainly, uh, because you do cover it from a lot of different angles. It's incredibly useful. And I don't say that about very many newsletters. So congratulations on no, your work I already there. appreciate that. Thank you, Jason. So I think it's a, it's fairly obvious to, to some people, or at least somewhat obvious, that you do hail from Great Britain now. Um, I've been I've had this theory for a while <laughs> that when it comes I'm to you, like the theory, I don't oh, know. I, I think you will. I think you will. It's It's also flattering. So you'll you'll like it. Um, I've had this theory for a while that when it comes to communications, public relations, and even to a degree advertising, you Brits have always been a bit more, I think, sophisticated in approach. Now, I've posed that suspicion to others on this show before. I wonder in your experience what you think the differences might be in what the industry looks like and the practice looks like in the UK versus perhaps what you see from us in the States. And and I'm not trying to kick up any dirt. I honestly think there are subtle differences that might be good or bad on either side. But I wonder if you you've ever noticed that Americans do things here or there differently? Oh, a hundred percent that we do things differently. And I think it was, it's, it's a hackneyed uh, quote, but uh, the, the great author, uh, George Bernard Shaw said that uh, the, the English and the Americans are, are nations divided by a, a language in common. Uh, and I think we, <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, um, there are so many sophistications and nuances that we think we, you know, we are. That, well, that's the the whole thing of communication, isn't it? You know, we are. Uh, uh, we, we think we're communicating. We're actually, you know, it, you've got to wait for that feedback. And is is the message being received? Is is the way it's being transmitted? And sometimes, most of the time, but not always, uh, not, not all the time. Even down to the you know, the, the months, you know, we're, we're you know we're in. I would say we're at zero six twelve. You would say you, we're we're twelve zero six for you know for example and you know just turning up at the right month is, is, is not always as easy as easy as that 
Listen, I, um, David Ogilvy, you know, great uh, advertising man and a very, very clever man. Um, uh, you know, he, 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 he was obviously English and, uh, um, but had tremendous success in in the US. Um, I think in Australia as well, English people tend to have success in the communications and advertising space as well. I don't know why. I mean, I'd like to say, you know, superior education. I don't, I don't suppose it is superior education. I'd like to say sort of more world, you know, more, more of a worldview. I don't suppose that's particularly true th- these days. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, it's a different sort of may, maybe self-deprecating sometimes. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know what the answer is, but there is certainly, uh, you know, a, a difference. And in, in, around, you know, the 1999s and the 2000s, there was this terrible contraction of words, uh, glocal and local. Where everything was glocal. Do you remember that, Jason? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there, there's a little bit of of sensibility behind that that terrible that terrible neologism, uh, where you have to think globally, but also. Uh, transfer it locally, and I'll give you. And I'm, I'm sorry for rabbiting on so much, but I'll give you a very short uh, example. I was at. Uh, I worked for almost a decade at United Business Media, and they were generous enough to pay for my MBA al- along the way. But um, they said to to me they 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 wanted to roll out some products uh, around uh, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. At the time, I was the the product manager for a big product for the for the UK, Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa. And they're they're saying it's all about you know and, and and I went to the offices in Times Square and there there was a, a senior manager or a, v, a senior VP there I should say thumping the desk and saying it's all about globalization 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 of course he was meaning Americanization Americanization <laughs> Americanization and uh, and and this was around news wires and of course you press the button you know on the AP wire and it goes out everywhere you know mm-hmm. um, but. You know, you press, the, you do the same around Europe, where there is no European wire. So it would be the national news agency in in France and Germany and Spain and the UK. And there's a, there's a patchwork there, and you have to know that you know the, the subtleties of each region, the subtleties of each uh, language, the opening hours, you know, the way things are different. So that that was twenty years ago, and that's you know that that memory served me well when I was working in Sydney. And again, you know, the, the, a, a company I was very fortunate to work for a, a really impressive company that was working towards an IPO and wanted it say they wanted it say in its prospectus that it was uh, a south uh, south east asian company and i thought you you're not, you're not really an australian company you're a sydney company so how you know how can you start, start to earn you know you, 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 the, the the term of being a southeast asian company and then you know we, we did some stuff and we did some surveys and then and then we were able to put that into the text so i think there's a lot of, of that about a, a language divided by a, or two nations divided by a, a language in common yeah, and I, I, it's interesting that you touched on the the sort of Americanization, meaning you know, hit the wire service and 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 spray that message out there, the spray and pray method, because I think that leads to a similar question about influencer marketing. There's lots of agencies and software platforms in the U.S. that offer scalability of influencer marketing. You can have a firm send out product samples, source user generated content, and the like from you know dozens or hundreds of influencers all at once. The British firms, though, that I've sort of studied and talked to are much more focused on what I think is a superior way of doing business and influencer marketing, which is much more one to one relationships, true creative partnerships and the like. Does that ring true for you or are there also British firms that approach things with that kind of Americanized spray and pray strategy? <laughs> well, uh, sadly, they're, you know, they're, they're jerks wherever you go. Uh, and then, well, any sort of uh, uh, sector of, of life, you know, try getting a plumber in where I live in South London. That's difficult enough. But there are lots of good plumbers around as well so it's, but it's you know it's difficult um yeah i think possibly the uk influencer marketing has sort of evolved from public relations and that and then public relations you kind of get it the subsect of public relations obviously media relations you understand about nurturing that relationship between you, you as a as an organization and the media that that can influence your, your target audience so you understand about building a relationship and i think that's where that's that's sort of where influencer marketing has evolved from uh whereas maybe in america it's evolved from the other angle it's from it's come sort of uh marketing and advertising led and that is more i would say 
pray and sp- pray and spray, but it, it may be it's from a, some a different ethos. Uh, and if you think about influencer marketing as a two by two matrix, and you've got trust down one side, uh, and you've got um, control down the other. Media relations, you've got uh, high trust because it comes through a, through a third party, but low uh, low control because you, you can't control what the journalist is going to say. And that's kind of where I think influence marketing has evolved from, maybe, in the UK. Uh, whereas if you come from the advertising standards, well, the advertising point of view, you've got high control, obviously. You, you pay and you get what, what you, you pay, you play. Uh, but you, you don't always get the high levels of trust. So I think that you know, there, there, this, in terms of the ethos of influence marketing, you're being pulled and pushed somewhere in the middle. Interesting. Well, I will say this, Talking Influence, which is the front face of a company that runs the Influencer Marketing Show, does the top 50 people in influencer marketing, which I think you're on every year. Um, uh, they are a UK firm, and there's nothing like that in the US. But I think in terms of trade bodies, uh, maybe the U.S. might have been a little faster to the market than the U.K., so let's call that a push. But speaking of trade bodies and the Influencer Marketing Show, you went uh, from industry voice consultant, frequent show host, uh, to lead uh, to the lead in the Influencer Marketing Trade Body. Tell us about that new organization and its purpose. Well, thank you. It's a beautiful segue. You've obviously done this thing before, uh, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> seamless, seamlessly done. Listen, um, you know, we weren't the first. You're right. I think the Influencer Marketing Association launched in two th- in America in 2018, and it's had various relaunches along the way. Um, I've been involved in, in other bodies and in, in other panels, trying to sort of throw a, 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 a lasso around us and trying to professionalise us in a slightly you know better, more organised way. But I was actually approached independently by and individually by three. Uh, different agencies, well, two agencies and a platform to say to, that said that their interests, they felt as if their interests in the UK weren't being best served by the existing offerings. And that, that's no slight on the, on the other offerings. Uh, you know, IAB, for example, looks after uh, digital advertising. And if digital advertising is somewhere in the region of sort of a $110 billion, uh, you know, or $120 billion a year, you know, uh, and influencer marketing is is somewhere sort of between sort of the thirteen and fifteen billion. You're only going to get sort of you know twelve percent of the time you know, if you if you factor it you know, accordingly. So, uh, but but the, these agencies approached me and said you know that their interests weren't being best uh, served by the existing things. And could I do better, or could we do better? And I suspect it's largely you know because I was independent and because of my age, not because I was massively brilliant. But uh, but or maybe they thought they had a lot of time time uh, at my at my disposal, but um, there there is a need you know uh, to to try and professionalise the space, um, and I think you know the, the the short term goal or the long term goal for any business is to stay in business that that's the art of business, but to do that and to do that you need to have you need to be you need to be profitable uh, and you need to have paying customers, but. To have long term um, long term growth within an industry, you need to uh, be able to tap into uh, suppliers and, uh, and 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 politicians and policy makers and platforms and publications, and you need to have that that mutual understanding, uh, not always agreement, but at least mutual understanding of, of where you come from, and that's what we've been trying to do this year. So the influence of marketing trade body we launched at the show at the tail end of of October at the Influencer Marketing Show. But there's been a lot of shovel work being done in the background over this year. Uh, for example, uh, the the United Kingdom Parliament, Parliamentary uh, Select Committee was, uh, was, was set up in May of this year uh, with an inquiry into influencer culture. And the Influencer Marketing Trade Body submitted some written evidence around that, uh, that select committee. And we've actually pushed back on some other uh, written evidence as well, which we found to be misleading. So we've pushed back there. So that, that's what we're doing with, with politicians. Um, I've, I've been in talks with the, the CMA, which is the Competition and Markets Authority. Um, they, uh, they, they look after, the regulation of influencer marketing, they protect the consumer. So where, where in the U- US you'd have the FTC, 
In the UK, we have self-regulators, which are which is the Advertising Standards Authority, but also a government watchdog, which is the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority. So we're in talks with them about making sure that uh, when they look revisit influencer marketing next year, that we're part of the group of people they talk to. And, and I spoke with them um, last week just about um, some green uh, uh, some codes they're putting around protecting the consumer ag- uh, about greenwashing. So it's about about politicians it's about policy makers we're talking with journalists the whole time just so so that we can that they can understand that influencer marketing isn't all about uh reality tv stars with big instagram followings there you know there are subject matter expertise and and the real core is, is the community that, that goes with that creativity so it's talking that so there, there are lots of p's here you know we're talking about politicians and policy makers uh publications but also you know we want to be align ourselves closer with the platforms with the instagrams with the facebook's with with the tiktoks and th- these conversations are, are slowly happening this year very nice now i, I know that the, a lot of those bodies and a lot of your work is obviously going to be focused on sort of the consumer protection side of things because that's what the government is more interested in but i wonder do trade bodies like yours have a role to play in governing the standardization of pay scales and if so how do you tackle that in a world that largely has no guardrails yeah, it's a fascinating uh, topic, and th- this could this could run and run, you know, for for several podcasts designated to to just this. Listen, there there are a whole flurry of um, of Instagram profiles and um, uh, um, organizations that have, that have been set up. Um, fuck you, just pay me. I think you you interviewed the. Uh, the, the person that, that that set that up uh there's the influence of pay gap and these come from a good place these come from a place where of of ir- irritation and wanting to to f- to level the playing field and that 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 is good um I think uh, I think so. We it has to be looked at in the round, and I'm absolutely sure. My gut says that absolutely sure that there is pay uh, dispar- disparity, both in terms of uh, colour and in terms of gender, without question. Where I do have a question is the, the relevant and accurate and w- detailed data at our disposal to, to look at this. Uh, and I think so, some of some of these sites are very um, anecdotal led, and they're not they don't have the luxury of a lot of data to so, to back them up. So I'm not trying to be mealy mouthed or using weasel words here. I absolutely think there is a problem here, but I think we all need to. Get, I think the the way to tackle it is probably to access to data and uh, anonymized data. Uh, which doesn't rely on sort of anecdotes uh, because there will always be people that have had terrible uh, tragedies, but that, uh, that shouldn't leave the whole, in- that shouldn't leave the whole industry. Um, and I think there are lots of other contributing factors why one creator might be paid a different amount to another creator. It might be uh, in terms of the deliverables or how, it, how, um, how many deliverables, whether it's a static image or, or video or the lead time, or the vertical they're in, or who owns the content, and for, and for how long. There are lots of other there, there's sort of subtleties that go in that aren't always de- declared uh, on these these sites, and it seems to be very sort of uh, black or white in terms of, or very binary, I should say, when it, when it's looked at. Uh, and I'd all, and the last thing, so I know I'm running away with this one, uh, Jason, <laughs> as is my my one. It's, a, it's a good topic to do that with, though. <laughs> well, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I and I as as, well, as you can hear now, I haven't fully managed to articulate what exactly what I, what I what I'm driving at. But if it's not handled appropriately and sensitively, it it, it there is a danger of creating vigilantism as well, and sometimes the the, the uh, brands don't get a right of reply and they're cancelled. Sometimes creators, you know, are, are you know they because they they're seen as getting beneficial rates, they they are sort of called out as well. So I think you know the best way is to try and just look at look, look at the data, and that requires us all to join hands and give access to to anonymized data. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So one of the uh, the trends that I think we're seeing of late, at least from a, a I think from a PR stunt perspective, more than anything else, though, uh, but I think it does actually root down to actual execution, is a move for brands and agencies to bring influencers and content creators into the fold as not just a partner, but as a full on creative director. I think uh, Cardi B was recently announced as the new creative director for Playboy. That might be a bad example because it's a stunty kind of thing with a celebrity, but that kind of stunt trickles down. Molly May Haig, I think, from Love Island was recently announced as a creative lead for Pretty Little Thing in the UK, which yep. is a fashion brand, yep. for those of you who don't don't know that. Now, Haig's not an advertising uh, creative. She's not an a- advertising executive. She's not even a fashion designer or necessarily a fashion expert. She's a reality TV star with a big footprint and obviously a well-respected fashion sense or reputation. But if I'm advising a client at Cornette that has a bunch of upside potential on TikTok, let's say, but I don't have a creative um, you know, director internally that has a TikTok pedigree, if you will. Why wouldn't I go out and find someone with those creative chops to in, you know, literally direct the brand there? Is this a trend you see expanding beyond the celebrity headlines? I, I think 100%. It's got, it's got to be. And we've, we've since, you know, the, uh, since the antediluvian times of, of 2016, we've been talking about co- the importance of co-creation of content. And uh, now it's about the co-creation of product as well. Um, so, you know, as brands begin to trust the, the creators they work with uh, uh, over the long over the long run and uh, open up their kimono a little bit and, uh, you know, so, so the, the, the creator and... Uh, and the brand can get can get really close, and and that, that so you blur the relationship between sort of promoter and uh, and part owner. We can we can talk about it a bit later, perhaps, but also uh, about how they how they're promoting the the, the product and forming the product. Uh, I, 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 you know, I think that makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. You've mentioned Molly May Haig, um, uh, and uh, her. Uh, new role at uh, pretty little thing but also uh precludes her from from working with competitors mm. uh for example i saw it first uh when when she, she was on um uh love island back in 2018 i think it was she wore a yellow dress i think that was from i saw it first it sold out within two hours so by working with pretty little thing it locks her into that as well so there are lots of different reasons why uh, you know wh- wh- why it's a good fit but I, you know, I, I think, um, I think we'll see a lot more of this, this blurring the line between promotion and building the, the brand, uh, and that makes that makes perfect sense to me. So uh, I think we're going to have to do a Scott Guthrie part two uh, at some <laughs> point. But uh, before we get out of here today, t- tell us what's next for the IMTB. What what news and actions can we expect to see from the trade body in twenty twenty two? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I wish I'd prepared prepared for that one. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of more of the same. Um, we talk, as I say, we're talking with the CMA. We're, we're talking with the, um, the the policymakers. The parliament, the parliamentary select committee is ongoing. They're they're calling for oral evidence at the moment as well. Maybe we'll be called to, to provide oral re- evidence for that. It, it's you know uh, it, it's building uh, more, getting more members on board. We've got six very strong members uh, since since launch. We've had uh, another ten that have wanted to join. So just just you know getting those getting those on board. Uh, so it's growing, uh, and then then setting up a, a series of groups as well um, around specialisms, and so that we can you know no one. I think gone are the days where you can be an expert in influencer marketing. I think now you're going to be an expert within a specialism within that, whether that is about compliance or about return on investment or about, uh, I, I don't know, social commerce. But we're trying to sp- set up those specialisms within the group as well. Very nice. If someone out there wants to know more or get involved with IMTB, what do they do? Uh, you can look us up, uh, the Influencer Marketing Trade Body, which is IMTB dot org dot co uh, no sorry dot org dot uk but we've also got the uh, the url imtb dot co sorry i was getting confused uh otherwise look at me uh just google my name scott guthrie uh influencer and then my name will pop up somewhere well there you go that was my next question was and for those out there who just want to soak up all your content like i do where can they find you and i guess you've answered uh answered that question <laughs> oh yeah just google that or the influencer marketing lab uh yeah that, that's that would be great that's good stuff scott it's always a pleasure my, to chat my friend thank you for the great content the leadership in the industry and thanks for taking some time for us silly americans here today 
<laughs> we're not silly Americans at all. It was an absolute delight, uh, Jason, to be uh, to be invited on. It's been a long time uh, getting the dates uh, involved, to, so we could we could make this thing happen. But thank you very much, and I'm sorry that the conversation meandered around so much. But I really I thoroughly enjoyed being a guest today. There's absolutely no reason to apologize. The meandering is what the podcast is for. I love getting deep into these topics, so it was uh, it was great to hear your perspective on it, and uh, we'll look forward to scheduling uh, Scott Guthrie episode two. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> vote, vote, vote now to avoid it. That's right. Thank you very much, Jason. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. <laughs>